my pleasure to welcome to the stage our next speaker, Dr. Lee Swanstrom. Tell us about poem. Thank you very much. Uh, my favorite subject, so I'm always happy to talk about poem. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about state of the art, uh, kind of review some very current literature, because unlike uh, Botox, uh, there's a barrage of literature, new literature in the realm of um, uh, poem uh, and even uh, achalasia, hell, or myotomy. Disclosures. So uh, just to set some ground rules uh, for it, uh, achalasia is a progressive but non-fatal disease. I've never in all my existence, you always hear about aspiration and death by pneumonia, but uh, even the most frail and elderly patients, extremely rare to ever die from their achalasia. But many of those patients wish that they were, were dead. And population incidence is remarkably homogeneous since the 18th century, uh, stable. It's not been going up or down, unlike GERD and like many of the other diseases we say, and it remains rare. One in 100,000, more or less, uh, for that. Rare genetic um, um, incidences of it, but uh, by and large, it stayed the same for generations and, and uh, centuries. Uh, symptoms are remarkably variable and unreliable, and that's going to be one of the biggest themes I hopefully will leave you with, is the unreliability of symptoms in achalasia. It's not curable, uh, so never tell your patients you're going to be cured, uh, because it's just not doable. But it can be effectively palliated and by multiple approaches. There's no single golden bullet for achalasia. On the other hand, once again, going back, palliation is not a cure of a disease, so these patients need lifelong follow-up. So these are kind of the, the ground rules, and I'll, I'll refer you this uh, article to you. Uh, it's worth uh, tearing out and keeping or downloading and pasting on your office wall. I think it's interesting because Half the AFS uh, membership is listed in this uh, document uh, that's put together by uh, Zanonoto, but uh, it's a wonderful thing, wonderful summary of current literature, uh, and it goes through all aspects of, of pediatrics, uh, everything um, uh, in the realm of achalasia treatment. So symptom reliability. Uh, I've never seen an achalasia patient come to my office that wasn't on PPIs for GERD. And by definition, achalasia patients do not have GERD. Uh, but they all get a GERD diagnosis, and that's just a universal finding. It's frequent uh, heartburn, regurgitation, and, and that's just something you have to deal with. And what you really want to hear about is dysphagia, because that's really the number one thing that bothers them. That's the uh, number one impact on their quality of life. And that's the number one reason that they come to see you is for their dysphagia. And occasionally asymptomatic, you find them. Uh, we lack tools to really quantify uh, the symptoms of our patients, and that's one of the reasons symptoms are such a bad metric for the disease of achalasia. The best that we have is the Eckhart score, and it really sucks. I mean, if you look at this, we often uh, measure a successful intervention in achalasia as an Eckhart score of three or less. And if you look at, if you had a patient that wasn't losing weight yet because they were drinking milkshakes, didn't have retrosternal pain, didn't say that they were regurgitating because they have an esophagus the size of a basketball, uh, and they have dysphagia with each meal, they're a successful intervention just in and of themselves. So that's not a good metric, but it's what we have, and it's what has become kind of the uh, de facto uh, outcomes measurement uh, uh, for achalasia. Maybe something this society can come up with is some better, better outcome metrics for the disease. Um, so this is uh, another just uh, incidental, uh, not much to do with uh, laparoscopic color myotomies, but I put this there just to kind of give you the impact of how useless symptoms are. Uh, this is kind of an old study that we did uh, at my place on color myotomies, and you'll see that patients had one year 24-hour pH studies. Of those with a 33% had a positive pH study, of those only 31% had GERD symptoms of any sort, heartburn, uh, regurgitation or anything and 47 patients complaining of horrible postoperative GERD after their Heller myotomy, only 50% of them had a positive pH study. So uh, what does this tell you? It tells you that when it comes to achalasia, uh, symptoms are a flip of the coin about whether the patient really has a disease or not. And I didn't really put anything here, but 
even with that, even 24-hour pH measurements or 48-hour pH measurements aren't the best unless you're really good at reading them. Uh, because these patients have delayed emptying, they get stasis, they get acidification uh, of their esophagus, or they get prolonged uh, washout phase after uh, drinking their orange juice for breakfast, even though you told them not to, and, and you have to really go through those pH reports yourself to really come up with a good, a, a good uh, interpretation of it. So not an easy, easy thing to come up with. This just reconfirms this. This is from a study of 100 uh, POEM patients to show you that uh, it's no different for POEM, uh, whereas only 50% of patients that had an abnormal 24-hour pH study were symptomatic, uh, and vice versa, many of the patients that were plenty of reflux uh, were negative. Uh, just uh, one other little item is that uh, I mentioned that in the ground rules that uh, any intervention is only palliation, it's not cure, and it doesn't matter what sort of treatment you do for it. And we often think the Heller myotomy is a gold standard because it's a permanent fix for it, and that's not true. Uh, we see these patients off and on. I've done this for 25 years, and I see patients I did 20 years ago. They come back. They need a little bit of a tune-up, even if it's savory dilation. Uh, they have a little mi minor, they ate a piece of chicken, got stuck, caused an inflammation, uh, and, and it's very common that these patients do come back and need some minor adjustments of their surgery, and in that regard, foregut surgeons become a little bit like chiropractors, and we have return visitors uh, for our patients. And that doesn't matter if it's a poem, uh, if it's a Heller myotomy, if it's Botox, if it's a balloon dilatation. maybe esophagectomy. They might be afraid to come back and see you. Uh, so, so the key to treatment uh, on this, and therapeutics is, uh, for any of these uh, spastic, is dis disruption. It's a division of the offending muscle, whether it's the distal esophageal muscle on the LES, or if you have pan spastic disorder of uh, the entire smooth muscle of the esophagus. And as we just heard, uh, you can do that by Botox. Um, it's effective, but it's highly temporary, can complicate the myotomy. And, and for that reason, it's pretty much these days relegated uh, really only for acute total obstruction. If we have a patient that comes in to the emergency room Friday night, uh, there's nobody good on call, uh, they're totally obstructed, they can't even take water, it's a nice thing to have in your armamentarium. Uh, this wasn't mentioned, but this is another nice uh, temporary palliation, uh, and this is relatively popular now in Europe, uh, placing a large 30-millimeter stent uh, for five days uh, kind of resu results in a fairly uh, good, uh, moderate term, six months to a year relief of achalasia, uh, but these patients are not happy. A 30-millimeter stent across the loris spastic loroesophageal sphincter is uncomfortable, causes horrible reflux disease, and that's a miserable week for the patients. But, but this does work a little bit, too, and it seems to be gaining some traction in some areas. So balloon dilatation, um, uh, a good therapy, a good uh, technique, um, 55 to 70 percent, and surgeons often, uh, but for one treatment, multiple treatments can bump that up to 90 percent, uh, so highly effective. Uh, Long-term follow-up, uh, it tends to fade a little bit, but it can be touched up quite easily. It's kind of minimally invasive. And perforation rate uh, is pretty low, uh, kind of in most uh, series around 3%. This is a nice uh, paper that came out, come out, came out a couple months ago uh, of a systematic review meta-analysis. Uh, 10 studies, 643 patients. I think that's a little bit of a signal thing there. It's a long period of time and only a few relative patients. Uh, because this is not widely uh, performed uh, that much anymore. Uh, anyway, at six months, uh, dilation with 30 uh, millimeter balloon, 81%, 35, 79, same, same result. But a planned serial dilatation to 40 millimeters, 75% at a year. Uh, Symptom-based serial dilatation seemed to be better, 86% uh, at a year. So very comparable to, uh, to uh, Heller myotomy, and we kind of know that from randomized prospective trials. Uh, perforations uh, with a large balloon, uh, initial dilatation is probably not a good idea, so uh, the message here is that you do sequential uh, dilatations. Maybe symptom-based uh, is better. Uh, that remains to be seen. 
Uh, and I can't really tell you, I do balloon dilatations, but we have masters of that in the room, so I'll leave it to them to kind of clarify what the best uh, recipe is. This may change it, so it's not popular. Uh, for whatever reason, it's a good treatment, it's minimally invasive, it's cost effective, and it just is not that popular. There's not that many places that really uh, offer it. Uh, there's not that many uh, gastroenterologists or surgeons that do it. Um, and, and maybe that's because of the workflow of going down to radiology. Uh, maybe it's because of the, the patients scream a bit and you pull out a bloody balloon. It's a little bit frightening and heart stopping. Uh, but this may uh, alter, alter this to some extent. This is the ESO flip uh, from um, the Crosswan uh, impedance planimetry. And it's a nice, easy, intuitive, visual way of doing it. Unfortunately, it's only a 30 millimeter balloon, but as we heard earlier uh, today, it might be a nice way to start, and it might, if you have an endoflip access, it might be a nice way to get into uh, balloon therapy. I should also mention that uh, while the American paradigm seems to be a hellermyotomy as a first option, or a poem increasingly, uh, in Europe and in Japan, uh, and many places in Asia, certainly a single treatment by balloon dilatation is de facto the way you treat achalasia by anybody. So whether they walk into a surgeon's office or a GI's office, they often get a 30 millimeter balloon. If they do fantastic, they go off the balloon track. If they fail, they go instantly into the surgical track. Uh, surgical treatment you know about, it's been a long time, um, kind of one of the older surgical foregut uh, procedures. Uh, altered a little bit to a single myotomy, uh, can you, you know, everybody kind of knows. But really, uh, the thing that uh, gave it wings was uh, in the early 90s, uh, doing it laparoscopically, a minimally invasive approach, um, and a very elegant uh, surgery that surgeons, foregut surgeons, love to do because it's very refined, delicate, uh, and uh, a really uh, tour de force for a surgeon to do. Uh, laparoscopic Heller myotomy, 1991. Uh, Carlos Pellegrini described thoracoscopic Heller myotomy, which turned out to be a dismal failure. <clears throat> Recurrence rates were huge, uh, poor resolution of, of, um, uh, of the dysphagia, and for that reason, that's almost never done, <clears throat> except in very specific cases. So you know the data, 80 90% long-term and medium-term uh, results. It go decreases a little bit. This is a very recent, uh, once again, two months ago, 1,001 laparoscopic Hellers. I think this is probably the uh, penultimate uh, clinical report on, on achalasia disease by a, a very prominent uh, Italian group that takes care of about two-thirds of the achalasia in Italy. Um, and 1,000 uh, Hellers, five-year follow-up, 89 good to excellent results. At 20-year follow-up, 80% good ex to excellent results. Uh, however, that included patients that required some reintervention uh, in that group, whether that was uh, dilation of achalasia balloon dilatation, simple dilation, or other treatments, uh, and only 9% abnormal 24-hour pH. Nobody's ever been able to meet that uh, criteria anywhere else that I know of. Certainly, uh, uh, we haven't uh, in Portland. So I mentioned that uh, any treatment that we do, it doesn't matter which it is, uh, decreases with time. Uh, natural tissue reaction, um, uh, subject to um, um, irritation of the esophagus, so you get a pill ulcer or something like that, uh, things can go down uh, a little bit with time, and that's certainly been uh, doable. And if you look at large public-based reports of Heller myotomy, you can really see that happening. If you look at these three studies, <clears throat> these were all randomized prospective studies, um, Bill Richards uh, did this one. You can see that uh, pH, and these are all pH studies uh, at, at late term uh, follow up around five years, 9%, uh, 47% abnormal pH. Um, once again, another story by uh, study by Rawlings, uh, 20, 40%, um, Amagi, 18%, 34%. So definitely kind of a more realistic kind of population based. Uh, picture of, of uh, that, and if you've ever scoped a late uh, 10 or 15 year old partial fundoplication for achalasia, you'll see a baggy uh, distended wrap uh, is very typical with a distended lower esophageal sphincter. Um, this is uh, just from a month ago, um, uh, 
they're just to show, I put this on to show there's still uh, controversies left uh, to solve with uh, surgical treatment or any other treatment. Um, which was better, a door or a toupee? You'll see various uh, uh, people in this uh, audience argue for one or the other. Uh, and as you can see here, it's a fairly uh, large amount of patients uh, that everything seemed to be fairly typical. Maybe toupees had some small advantage, although it makes no logical sense why they would have a shorter length of stay, so I'm not sure how, how uh, valid that is. So, of course, uh, we have balloon dilatation and laparoscopic heller. They're both very good treatments. So why would we ever need anything else? Well, anything can always be better. Uh, we, yeah, balloon dilatation outpatient, very effective. Laparoscopic heller may be more effective, but inpatient and hospital and expensive. And, of course, Jay Pashrika, who's not here, came up with a clever idea while playing around with notes uh, of accessing the submucosal plane and doing a myotomy, uh, and now known as poem, uh, thanks to Haru Inoue, uh, who described the first clinical cases. And this has spread like wildfire, and now every major achalasia center in the world uh, essentially has poem as one of its offerings. Uh, and uh, it's been a very good treatment, very popular. Patients love it. Uh, clinicians love doing it, whether they're surgeons or gastroenterologists. And it's because it represents one of the kind of a highlights. So just as I said, surgeons like doing a laparoscopic heller myotomy because it's delicate and refined. Uh, GI people or interventional endoscopists like doing POEM because it's delicate and refined and uses some very uh, nice, complex uh, uh, surgical techniques. I'm not going to show this. You're all familiar with uh, kind of what POEM looks like, crea creation of a tunnel, and just for the sake of time, uh, uh, I'm going to skip over that. So uh, systematic review very recently, um, kind of looking at only seven studies. Uh, unfortunately, the literature is new for this, and as you can see, their conclusion is clinically it seemed to be safe and good, but that the quality of data really wasn't there to really define its place in the hierarchy of, of, uh, of uh, achalasia treatments. Uh, so using our own data, this is kind of a report of uh, kind of our first 100 uh, patients uh, from a while back. Uh, operative times are reasonable, uh, minor morbidities, uh, patients are largely pain-free or minimal pa pain-free, and very important, it's very minimally invasive, back to work in three days, uh, zero to seven. A very profound relief of uh, dysphagia. So it's compared to a laparoscopic helomotomy and partial fundoplication, where it takes two to six weeks for the patient to maximize their uh, dysphagia relief. Uh, poem's almost instantaneous and very profound. A good uh, relief of the lower esophageal sphincter, but not what you would expect, not quite as low as uh, surgical. Complications are there. <clears throat> it's a true surgery, but they're rare, 16% overall complications. And on, occasional, on occasion, they're quite severe complications, empyema, uh, perforations, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, very good. And it's been shown to be uh, long-lasting, uh, up to two years, certainly. 96% uh, early success, 83% la late. Uh, this is from our own series at five uh, years. 83% uh, good to excellent um, uh, there. And very consistently, abnormal 24-hour pH uh, tests in around 38%. And that's across the board. Almost every study that it measures pH studies uh, shows about a 38% uh, rate of GERD. Works well for spastic disorders as well. Uh, this is kind of a recent uh, publication that we had looking at uh, DES, uh, nutcracker esophagus, and, and jackhammer esophagus. And you'll see a, a fairly high rate of uh, chest pain relief, 86% uh, around, and once again, about a 33% rate of reflux disease after that. Uh, we have found some contraindications uh, to POEM, uh, so we don't do it in everybody. Uh, if they're not a candidate for general anesthesia, of course, of course, uh, if they have a hiatal hernia at all, we don't do it any longer because we found quite high rates of reflux disease uh, if they need laparoscopy for some other reason, gallbladder, et cetera. And sadly enough, uh, our major contraindication is insurance denial. Uh, we now get about uh, 
over a third of our patients denied for treatment of POEM because it's uh, investigational, uh, as you can see here from Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, um, insufficient evidence to determine the safety or efficacy, um, and therefore investigational. So unfortunately in the United States, uh, POEM is considered an experimental procedure even though it's 10 years old. Uh, how about just briefly the GERD controversy? Um, uh, there's been some meta-analysis that showed that it's fairly comparable to a late-term um, Heller myotomy and partial fundoplication. Um, no significant difference uh, in rates uh, in this meta-analysis, looking at four uh, retrospective studies. Um, Rapici uh, did a more recent uh, kind of meta-analysis. I think it's a little bit better done and more comprehensive, and shows indeed that POEM does have a, a higher rate of reflux disease, whether measured symptomatically by esophagitis or by 24-hour pH testing uh, than a Heller myotomy, although I have to say the majority of the pH testing that was done in these series of Heller myotomy was done within a year. So these were early, early results, and as I mentioned, over time it seems like uh, partial fundoplications lose their efficacy to some extent and there's more reflux. I think that there's things that we can do uh, technically uh, to improve that. This is from comparing our earliest experience with a 45% uh, incidence of reflux disease by pH testing to a more recent uh, series where we used uh, FLIP to shorten our length of myotomy and tailor it to achieve uh, set endpoints and have shown a decrease uh, by about 20% of our reflux uh, rates. So in conclusion, uh, achalasia is a rather special circumstance as it's both rare and incurable. Uh, luckily, there's several palliative therapies that work quite well, and uh, it's nice to have um, options. Uh, because of its rarity and treatment across specialties, it's very, very unlikely it'll ever be a definitive best treatment. Uh, the, to power a randomized prospective study uh, for achalasia, seeing how close the results are for all those studies would take thousands and thousands of patients in each arm, and for that reason, I don't think it'll ever be done. Uh, Botox should be reserved for very selective temporizing indications. Uh, POEM, lap heller myotomy, and, and uh, pneumatic dilatation are all acceptable first-line treatments. All have similar risk profiles and a mild but progressive decrease in the efficacy with time. Patients must be very worked up and objectively followed up forever. And I'll kind of refer you to this that came out last month as well. This is based on the National Health Service in England and it showed a seven-fold increase after uh, achalasia treatment in squamous cell cancer uh, by the National Health Service's uh, thing. So these patients need followed up for that, uh, and American insurance companies are idiots, but that's another subject. <laughs> Thank you.